is September 12th, 1952, a year that saw scientific advancements, including the development of the polio vaccine and consumer goods becoming more readily adopted. Americans enjoyed homes, automobiles, and kitchen appliances as part of the post-war boom that saw some families experiencing a high standard of living. While American prosperity was on the rise, so too was interest and fear in the unknown that was coming ever closer to home. This paranoia was driven in part by the Cold War and technological advancements of the time that made the world both more accessible but also more dangerous. Children growing up during this time, with increased access to television and radio, would have heard of flying saucers, a phenomenon that gained steam in the 40s and erupted in the 50s. 1952 in particular was rife with UFO-related hype and activity. Project Blue Book, the code name given to a government group that studied UFOs, quietly launched in March of that year. The primary goals were to determine if UFOs were a threat to national security and to analyze related data. Even Life Magazine, an extremely popular publication, had decided to publish a story on flying saucers in March, titled, Have We Visitors from Space? wherein it said, The Air Force is now ready to concede that many saucer and fireball sightings still defy explanation. Life offers some scientific evidence that there is real case for interplanetary saucers. By June, the Air Force had been sent over 140 sightings. In July, America experienced the invasion of Washington when seven objects were observed at Washington National Airport and in the surrounding area. These objects garnered attention as they were not in the pathways for military or civilian flights. Other sightings of the objects were reported that day, the accounts culminating with the UFOs flying past the White House and Capitol building. Concern was so high that fighter jets were sent out after them. Newspaper headlines were published, reading, Saucers swarm over capital, and this time it's hard to brush off mysterious saucers. By all accounts, America was well aware of flying saucers, even if they were not entirely aware of what they actually were. This is the backdrop of the country when, on an otherwise quiet night, a group of children witnessed something quite unexplained. The day is coming to an end, and the sun is starting to set on a mild summer Friday in Flatwoods, West Virginia. With the school day done, children are out playing in the small town, home to just over 300 people. Out in the schoolyard, a small game of football is underway, with players including brothers Edward and Freddie May and Tommy Heyer. Suddenly, a bright object, described as an oval-shaped ball of fire, flew overhead and appeared to crash onto the property of a farmer, G. Bailey Fisher. Excited and intrigued, the trio ran home to Edward and Freddie's house to tell the boys' mother, Kathleen May, about what they saw in the evening sky. After hearing the boys' story, Kathleen gathered the group, now including Neil Nunley, Ronnie Shaver, Eugene Lemon, a 17-year-old National Guardsman, and a local dog. The group made their way up the hill, over the property fence, and into the woods surrounding the farmland. As they moved deeper into the woods, they began to pick up on a strange, egg-like smell and see a faint mist spreading out over the grass. Lemon led the group, shining his flash out across the tree line. At once, the dog took off barking into the mist before then flying back past them a moment later. Lemon moved his flashlight up to the trees beside them as suddenly a large metallic frame came into focus. Screams erupted as the light brought the enormous creature into view. It was described as 10 feet tall, with a bright red face and glowing eyes that illuminated the area around it. It appeared to have a green, skirt-like garment covering its lower body, made of some sort of metal. Its head was shaped like the ace of spades. As the flashlight hit it, the creature began to hiss, like frying bacon, as described by Kathleen, releasing a dense cloud of mist. The air filled with the nauseating fumes and an oily substance was thrown onto Kathleen and the children below it began to hover towards the group. Lemon dropped his flashlight and ran back through the trees and over the fence, the others close behind. Once they returned home, Kathleen called the sheriff, who had been out investigating a local plane crash, and the local newspaper, to inform them both of the encounter. The grandmother of the May siblings stayed with them and cleaned the oily substance from them. Horrifyingly, it wasn't long before the children's throats became so swollen that they could not eat or drink. The Mayboys weren't the only ones to experience health issues after the encounter. 
Lemon was seriously ill, experiencing convulsions and vomiting throughout the night. For many of the group, their symptoms persisted for weeks following the encounter. One doctor who treated them said that their condition was similar to that of those attacked with mustard gas. The incident was detailed to the Air Force, and investigators came to review the scene. They stated that there was an unusual smell in the area. It was said that the trees were singed at the top and had broken branches, as though something had come down from the sky. Marks were also found in the dirt, as was flattened grass and a slick substance. This is one of the cases where Project Blue Book was doing an active investigation. They reviewed the May family's report and drawings, which all showed a hooded creature with spindly arms and sharp claws. All drawings were remarkably similar. One of the members of the Project Blue Book team was J. Allen Hynek. He was said by his son, Joel Hynek, to have seen the case as puzzling and wasn't able to conclude anything one way or another. However, the conclusion that many came to was that the bright oval-shaped ball of fire was a meteor and that the creature was a mistaken barn owl. Giving credit to the theory of a meteor is that many meteors were seen in the sky across the eastern U.S. that very night. Just as it does today, news travels quickly. The co-editor of the Braxton Democrat, the local paper, interviewed the witnesses and was able to visit the site. Upon arriving, he found the grass of a strange smell and also saw the marks on the ground. He was quoted as saying, Those people were the most scared people I've ever seen. People don't make up that kind of story that quickly. More local newspapers picked up on the story, and soon it gained national attention, during a time when fears of invasion and the unknown were continuously flamed. Headlines ran, Braxton County residents faint, become ill, after running with weird 10-foot monster, and red-faced monster seen. A week later, Kathleen May flew to New York to be interviewed by CBS for their show, We the People. It was through these news reports that the world was introduced to the creature, which would go by many names. The Green Monster, the Braxton County Monster, but perhaps most recognizably, the Flatwoods Monster. While the sighting that took place that warm September night in 1952 is the most widely known encounter, some reports claim that it was not the only one, and it was the encounters that took place before the run-in at Fisher Farm that are of particular interest. Three weeks before, a mother and a daughter in Weston reported having seen a figure similar to that seen by the May Group. During the encounter, they too experienced an intense odor. The effect of this run-in was enough to put the daughter in a local hospital for treatment. A few days prior to September 12th, a strange sighting was reported by Mrs. Harper. According to the witness, she and her friends were walking through the woods in the town of Heaters, about five miles from Flatwoods, on their way to the local store. About half a mile into their trip, the group noticed what appeared to be a ball of fire on the hillside. They dismissed the light, assuming the neighbors were hunting. But when they looked back, they saw something that terrified them. A human-shaped figure standing where the fire had burned, standing three times the height of a man. Scared, the group took off. This story is interesting as it does come in before the famous encounter on September 12th. However, the story is short and it isn't clear exactly what the group encountered. It isn't described as a green and red glowing mechanical monster, There is no mention of its appearance outside of being man-like. For this reason, we might hesitate to call this a Flatwoods monster sighting, but it is strange and would have been a worthwhile additional investigation. Mrs. Harper is quoted as saying in a letter obtained by the Flatwoods Monster Museum from her granddaughter, I think I'm at least average in smartness, but think me crazy if you will. I will never believe anything else. On September 13th, in the early morning after the Fisher Farm incident, the director of the Board of Education in Flatwoods saw a flying saucer take off away from his house. He reported it to the paper and was then informed of the event that had taken place the night prior. Next, on September 13th, in Strange Creek, a town about 20 minutes from Flatwoods, the Sitowski family was driving between Braxton and Clay County when their car died. Mr. Sitowski went out into the dark night to try to restart the car. The car was not in poor condition, making its sudden halt unexpected. And unfortunately, he was unable to get the car to start, and at that time, the road was deserted. As the couple discussed what to do, a strong, pungent odor filled the night air. Their baby began to cry. Suddenly, Mrs. Sentowski screamed and told her husband that there was something behind him. Rising out of the darkness was a nine-foot-tall, reptilian and bony-faced creature 
that made its way towards a stranded car. The family dove into their vehicle, hiding as the creature approached. They reported that it ran a hand across the hood before it disappeared into the night. Again, this creature does not fit the description provided by the May Group. Instead of a machine-like creature, the Sotowskis report a lizard-like monster. Some have purported that what the May Group witnessed was the same creature seen by the Sotowskis days later, just that the monster was encased in protective armor or controlling a craft. In more recent years, an episode of Monster Quest in 2010 called the Flatwoods Monster the Lizard Monster, combining the two encounters into one creature. This is more likely a case of an evolving legend than an accurate portrayal of the 1950s experiences. No significant sightings of the Flatwoods Monster have been reported since the year 1952. If you visit the town of Flatwoods today, you'll find that it is still very much a small town. The population is about the same as it was over 60 years ago. A large sign introduces visitors to the town, reading, Welcome to Flatwoods, home of the Green Monster. Residents have certainly embraced their strange visitor. On Main Street, there is now the Flatwoods Monster Museum. The museum includes historical items, books, and memorabilia from the encounter. You can even purchase shirts, hats, books, and more. One can also find five Flatwoods Monster chairs located across Braxton County. Each one is 10 feet tall and 4 feet wide. There is even a restaurant called The Spot that serves alien-themed subs like the Monster Burger and has a Flatwoods Monster-themed interior. A festival celebrating the monster is held each year. These attractions help to bring in hundreds of visitors whose purchases help support the local economy. The Flatwoods Monster has impacted culture even outside of West Virginia. Different video games, like Fallout 76, reference the legend. Perhaps the most significant indicator that the Flatwoods Monster has had an impact on entertainment and culture is the fact that we are still talking about it today. A 10-foot creature with glowing eyes, a blood-red face, head shaped like the Ace of Spades, and a metallic body. This is the Flatwoods Monster. But what exactly was the creature? A common and widely accepted explanation is that the oval ball of fire seen by children while they played in the schoolyard was a meteor. As mentioned previously, there is some support for this theory in that several meteors were seen traveling across West Virginia that same night. As for the creature itself, many put forth the theory that it was a barn owl that was frightened by the group's appearance. Barn owls do raise their wings, forming a spade-like formation, and their vocalizations are quite different from other owls. They sound like... The red lights were thought to be airplane beacons that the group could have misidentified out of increased stress. The fog could have just been the fog that Appalachia is well known for. Think the Smoky Mountains. The illness experienced by the witnesses was shrugged off as hysteria. Combined, these paint a simple explanation of what the May group encountered on the Fisher farm. The ordinary turned into the extraordinary due to preconceived ideas and active imaginations. While this reasoning satisfies many curious investigators, some still sit with questions. What of the sightings of a UFO from the director of the Board of Education, a call that came the next morning before the news had been printed? What about the sightings that happened in the days and weeks prior to the May Group's encounter? As the creature hasn't been seen since the early 50s, we may never have a solid answer. But for those of us captivated by the unexplained, the mystery itself is enough. Thank you for listening to tonight's story. Tune back in next time as we dive into the world of cryptids, extraterrestrials, and the great unknown. Good night.